Let's bow our heads. I want to talk about standing in the gap, a very important message for us to hear today. Lord, thank you for the promise that you're with us. We want to open your word. We want you to speak to us. Please, Lord, grace this place with your presence so we can focus on you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The year was 509 B.C., and the Etruscan army was bearing down upon the city of Rome. This was in the days of Rome's infancy, before it became the mighty nation we read about in history books. The Roman army was just a ragtag team. It retreated inside the city walls like a dog with its tail between its legs. Meanwhile, the Etruscans numbered in the tens of thousands, their swords and spears gleaming in the afternoon sun. There was only one thing that stood between the Etruscans and sure victory. They had to cross over the Tiber River to get to that little city of Rome, over a, a footbridge made of stout beams that went over the Tiber. The Romans, on the other hand, knew that the only ghost of a chance they had to save their city was to cut away that bridge before the Etruscans got to it. So it was a race against time. The Etruscans bearing down and Several of the large Roman soldiers chopping away on that bridge, chips flying, trying to finish off that bridge before the Etruscans got there. Soon it became evident there, there would not quite be enough time to finish that bridge. And so this young Roman soldier by the name of Horatius, you can read about him in Wikipedia or whatever, he may be part fact, part fiction, we're not sure, but the folklore goes that he stood in the gap between the oncoming Etruscan army and the foot of that bridge. And he unsheathed his sword, and as the Etruscans bore down, he began to cut left and right. He would slay those soldiers as they came manfully on. He felt the sting of the blows. He tried to glance those blows off with his shield, and his muscles ached. It seemed like forever trying to give his compatriot time to cut away the bridge. Finally, after an eternity, he heard the creak and groan of the bridge behind him as it swept into the Tiber. Rome was saved that day because of one man who stood in the gap. I'd like for you to take your Bibles. Let's look at standing in the gap. There is a Bible verse that illustrates so beautifully how God calls us to stand in the gap today. Look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30. Ezekiel 22 and verse 30. We're going to start here, but we're going to be going several passages here tonight illustrating so beautifully how God is calling each and every one of us tonight to stand in the gap. And I want to forewarn you at the end of this message, I'm going to ask you to make a recommitment with me. Let's be prayer warriors and stand in the gap with Jesus. I want to set the table first of all. Chapter 22, God indicts his people. They have played the part of a spiritual harlot. They've gone after other idols and other gods rather than remaining true and faithful to the one and only true God. And if you read through chapter 22, the first 16 verses, I have actually written in my margin where Israel was breaking every one of the Ten Commandments. You know, here he, they broke the Fourth Commandment, the Seventh Commandment, and they, so forth, so on. And what really gets me is that it was the prophets, the priests, and the princes that led them into sin. It's amazing. So God was going to have to withdraw his presence and allow his people to experience the natural consequences of when we rebel. And the city was going to be decimated by the Babylonians. But before God took such stringent measures, he was looking for someone to stand in the gap. Look at verse 30 now. Verse 30. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. What does the text say? But I found no one. 
God looked around that city, probably numbering hundreds of thousands. He couldn't find a single man, a single woman, a single youth who would stand in the gap in intercessory prayer in behalf of that wayward city. So they were taken into Babylonian captivity. This verse illustrates so beautifully how God is calling us to stand in the gap today. We're told in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 19, that the enemy comes in like a, remember, like a flood. And God wants us to be like Horatius, to stand in the gap in behalf of our loved ones, our children, our grandchildren, our parents, our work associates, our neighbors. He's calling us to stand in the gap. Scripture is replete with many examples of people who stood in the gap. I have this little professor in me that has to have you turn to each other and share, okay? So you've got one minute, turn to your neighbor, and who can you think of in Scripture that was a prayer warrior, an intercessory prayer warrior? Share with your neighbor for a minute. Okay, I hear lots of buzz out there. That sounds good. Call out someone you thought of who was an intercessory prayer warrior in Scripture. Daniel. I hear Abraham. Moses. Ezekiel. Elijah. Jesus, right? All of these wonderful examples. Let's take a look at just several of these real quick, and then I want to share some contemporary stories about how we can stand in the gap. I think of Moses. Look at Psalms 106. Psalms 106. Moses was given the task of leading. We don't know the exact number, but some scholars say it was about 1.6 million people out of Egypt. I don't think I would have wanted that task, Harold. Can you imagine the sanitation challenges they would have had? 1.6 million in a place without a septic system? I don't know how that worked. But uh, these were a bellyaching, complaining people. But in Psalms 106 and verse 19, the text tells us that while God was giving the Ten Commandment law to Moses, remember on top of Mount Sinai? The people were down there doing what? I'm afraid they were not fasting and praying. <laughs> they were having a party. And some say they were, you know, a, a naked frenzy, dancing around that golden calf. And Moses said, what's that sound I hear? It's a strange sound. God and Moses had a little conversation. You know, Moses, you and I are going to go up to Canaan, but these people aren't worthy. I think God was trying Moses. Moses immediately stood in the gap, did he not, and said, God, you can't abandon your people. You've made a covenant with them. If you're going to take them out, blot my name out first. And notice what verse 23 says. Therefore he, God, said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, done what? Stood before him in the breach. That word breach or gap is parets in the Hebrew. It's the same exact word used back in Ezekiel 22.30. Moses literally stood in the gap like Horatius. God, spare your people. I think of Abraham. Did he not stand in the gap? You know, Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus, stopped by the tent. They fed him a pretty good meal and the two angelic messengers that came along with him. Lord, if there's just 50 in Sodom and Gomorrah, will you not spare the city? 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. Then I think of Daniel in Daniel chapter 10. One of Daniel's contemporaries was Jeremiah. Jeremiah had said, God had said through Jeremiah, my people are going to be in captivity how many years? Seventy years. At seventy, I'm going to release them. But it was conditional upon 
confession, repentance, and obedience. And Daniel looked around, there was everything but that. So we're told in Daniel chapter 10, one of the longest recorded prayers in the Bible, God, we have transgressed, please forgive us. And I believe it's because of Daniel's prayer standing in the gap that Israel was released from Babylonian captivity. You see how prayer makes a difference? It's not just some futile exercise we, we do. Prayer makes a decided difference. I think of uh, Elijah. Look at, look at James. James chapter 5. Elders, we often turn to James 5, do we not, when it comes to that request? Please, anoint me, anoint me, pray over me that I might he be healed in the name of the Lord. In that same context, it says in verse 16, confess your trespasses to one another, pray for one another, that you may be what? Healed. The effective Fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then God hastens to add a little exhibit. Here, here, here's an example of an effective, fervent prayer and refers back to Elijah. You ever wondered why Elijah prayed, Lord, stop the rain? You know, is that a prayer we usually pray? Aren't we usually praying, Lord, let it rain? We've had a lot of drought this last summer. Let it rain. But Elijah knew that Baal worship involved worshiping Baal, the fertility god, the rain god. And if people saw Baal was powerless to send rain, then they would turn their hearts back to God. And in that context, we see Elijah doing several amazing things. First of all, in 1 Kings chapter 17, remember the widow he stayed with? That little boy, that only son, that pride and joy of her life. She had no husband, she had no family, except for that boy. We don't know how old he was, maybe 12. He died. And we have a picture of Elijah scooping him up in his arms and carrying him upstairs to the upper room. That little room that 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 widow supplied for him. Elijah got free room and board up there. And he lays him out on the bed and he says, Oh God, God in heaven, restore the life of this boy. And three times, and God restored that life. And that same boy that went up this purple, lifeless form came back down those steps completely healed. A short time later, Elijah figuratively carries the whole nation of Israel in his arms up to the summit, Carmel. And they come down, a revived, a, a revived nation, having turned their hearts to God. Here's the point. I believe that we can carry our loved ones, our neighbors, our work associates, our friends who are dead in trespasses and sins, we can carry them figuratively to the upper room in prayer. People go up to the upper room dead. They come out alive. And we can pray for those in our life that God will do something special for them. But I love the example that surpasses all of these. It's the example of Jesus. He is really the greatest prayer warrior, is he not? Look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 59, Isaiah 59, we Adventists know about Isaiah 58, you know, it talks about standing in the gap, building up the wall and repairing the breach, that same Hebrew word, peretz, is used, but the next chapter, chapter 59, God has an indictment against the human race. In verse 2, it says, your sins have separated you from me. And in verse 11, verse 11 it says, salvation is far from us. And in verse 16, Jesus speaking, Jesus speaking, the pre-incarnate Son of God, here's what it says of Jesus. When he saw this damnable situation, verse 16, he saw, Jesus saw that there was no man 
and wondered that there was no intercessors. Sounds like Ezekiel 22.30, doesn't it? Jesus looked around on planet earth and there was no man. There was no intercessor. There was not a single person standing in the gap. So he approached the Father and said, Father, I'll become that man. I'll become that man. So Jesus went through the incarnation. He was born in that dirty stable or that cave, some scholars say. And he became that man. And Jesus became that mighty Horatius that went up against the whole evil force. Look at verse 17. For he, Jesus, put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. And at Calvary's cross, he went up against the whole Etruscan army. He stood in the gap, literally. He hung suspended between a holy God and an imperfect people. And it wasn't that he was trying to beg God to love planet earth. It says God so loved the world that he gave his son. The whole Godhead was invested in our behalf. They did whatever it took to save lost humanity. And at Calvary's cross, Jesus defeated the whole evil force. Praise God. I'm so glad that Jesus took my sin. Isaiah 53, 6. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And Jesus was cut off. He was cut off. Unlike Horatius, he gave his life. He was willing to experience eternal separation from the Father so that we could have eternal fellowship. Don't you love him? I love him. Now would you allow me to share some stories? Some stories. How standing in the gap has become, uh, I tell you, I have a burden for this in my own life. First of all, where would any of us be if people had not stood in the gap for us? I remember when I was a student at Southern Missionary College back in the day, before it had its Southern Adventist University status. And it's interesting how God has brought me full circle to teach young men and women there. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. But I was there on campus, and I was confused about my faith. I had this legalistic understanding. If I can just get perfect, if I can just get good enough, then God will look upon me with favor and open the golden gate for me one day. And I set out with a vengeance to accomplish that. In one of my classes... It was biblical lit, taught by a little lady by the name of Manon Ham. The professor that had the most impact on me was not my theological professors, my theology professors. It was an English teacher. And Manon Ham was, was very, uh, some lady, she would come into the classroom 30 minutes before class and pray over every desk. Yeah, I know my students sit the same desk, not because it's required. They were creatures of habit, right? Don't you sit the same place in the same pew every Sabbath, Sabbath after Sabbath? I know you do. So here she is praying over these desks, and she's praying for me. And that year, I found righteous by faith, and I found Jesus as my best friend and Savior. And where would I be without prayer? And so I graduated from Southern, and I got out to my very first assignment, was in Birmingham, Alabama. Now, Joy is here. Joy, you're from Alabama. I spent a whole year in Birmingham working with a senior pastor, and I was going to show the conference how it was done, Gary. I was going to have record baptisms and have a wonderful report printed up in the Southern Tidings and all that good stuff, and it didn't quite work that way. I had... Dozens of Bible studies going, directed the Pathfinder Club, but nothing was happening. And I got frustrated, and I got disillusioned. I said, Lord, what's wrong? And I remember one day, the straw that broke the camel's back, I was down in Sylacauga, Alabama, Highway 280, headed south out of Birmingham. That's Jim Neighbors Highway, by the way. Jim Neighbors was from Sylacauga. 
and I, I was scheduled to have a, an afternoon appointment, 2 p.m. appointment with a lady, and for three weeks in a row, she didn't show up. And I said, Lord, this is all for naught. And I remember driving over to the gravel parking lot of the Sylacauga Church, and I pulled in under a shade tree. This was summertime, and I rolled the window down, and I cried. I said, God, something's not right. What is wrong? What is wrong? And I remember opening my Bible, a good thing to do when you're desperate, amen? And I said, you know, I knew the book of Timothy was written by a seasoned pastor Paul to a young intern Timothy, how to have a successful ministry. So I turned there and I began to read. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, I came to a screeching halt. Look there at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, this is the words, the word from the Lord that God hit me with. Therefore, Paul says, I exhort, I urge, I beg, I plead with you. First of all, that word first is protos in the Greek, same word found in Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all this other stuff will be added unto you. So that really got my attention. What am I supposed to do first of all before mailing out handbills and giving out glow tracks and having Bible studies and conducting evangelistic series and having health seminars and dinner with the doctor and community service center work and before any of that God said therefore I exert, exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And God hit me in the heart. I said, Lord, I've been doing all these other things, but I haven't been first of all praying. And then my eyes fell down on verse 4. Why do we pray? What's the purpose of prayer? Verse 4, speaking of God, it says, who desires all men, all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Do you have people in your life that don't know Jesus? They do not have salvation. And if Jesus were to come tonight, they would be lost for eternity. Do you have people in your life like that? Maybe it's a son or daughter. Maybe it's a close relative. Maybe it's a close friend. God puts those prayer burdens on your heart for a reason. And then there are other people that know Jesus. They have the joy of salvation, but they don't have a knowledge of the truth. The end time, three angels' message truth that will galvanize them through the deceptions of the Antichrist beast power. And we have a responsibility as Seventh-day Adventists to declare this distinctive message in the end time. The gospel in the context of the three angels' message. I said, all right, Lord, guilty as charged. And I began to make out a prayer list and began to pray for people. And I saw miracles begin to happen. Not so much out here first. The miracles began to happen inside here. God had to change my heart first. Rather than seeing people as, you know, like, like pelts on my belt, And I began to pray for people because they were precious to God. And God gave me a shepherd's heart. And I began to love these people. And then I began to see miracles happen out here. And so many years of ministry goes by. And sometimes I'm hot and sometimes I'm cold when it comes to prayer. And sometimes I'm consistent and sometimes I'm really hit and miss. You all ever been there? And about eight years ago, Melvin Santos, who is a pastor at uh, Nashville First Church, he's now executive secretary up in Alaska. Yeah, he, he's kind of transitioned, but he did a lot of discipleship training for our pastors in Kentucky 10. And he shared with me and us the idea of the prayer journal. And the idea is you get this three-ring notebook binder filled with college-ruled paper, and it's five tabs. And every morning I pray 
over one of those five tabs. First tab is personal, for personal, for my own personal needs and for my family. I pray for my wife every morning. I pray for my kids. I pray for my grandson. I've got a one-year-old grandson. Hallelujah. It's a good thing. And then the second tab, I pray for the church, my pastor. I pray for our Oaks Elementary School. I pray for the students. I pray for my fellow church members. That's tab two. I pray for the evangelistic meetings that are going on right now at our Udawal Church that Pastor Douglas Naa and the SALT team is doing. And I pray for those needs. And in tab number three is the harvest, where I pray for specific people that God has laid on my heart. I pray for Jerry next door. And I pray for Roger around down about a half a block down. And I've been in their home, and we've had some great conversations. And I'm praying for people that God has put in my life. And then tab number four, I'm praying for specific needs, like marital needs and financial needs and health needs of people around me. And then tab five is my daily prayers. You see tab one, two, three, four is just list, a roster of different prayer needs. And I date it, and then I date it again when it's answered. But tab five, I pray for one tab every day, and I just scan through it. It used to be that there were hundreds of these prayer requests, and it's too heavy. I can't, I'm not Jesus. I can't pray for all these every day. So I would just scan through one tab every day and ask, God, who do you want me to pray for today? Who do you want me to labor over today? And so under that tab five, I'll write out an urgent prayer on behalf of maybe just two, three, four of these prayer needs. And uh, I always start my prayer time with a little triangle of praise, several praises, and then these special petitions. And that has been a tremendous blessing in my life. I can't tell you how God has blessed me and changed me through that experience, that daily experience. God knew how much I needed that prayer journal right then. About two months after I began prayer journaling in May of 2011, my daughter started dating someone that... uh, This relationship scared me to death. All right, parents, have you ever had a teenage son or daughter that starts dating someone and you know you watch watch the morals and the the disposition of your son-daughter spiral downhill? And the more I talked with my daughter, the more pushback I got. You ever gotten that? You know when you can't say anything more. And God said to me one day, he said, David, stop talking to Beth and just talk to me. And so every day in my jogging, the network of trails behind Highland Academy, I would pray, God, save my daughter. And every day, rolling around the conference as ministerial director, I would pray, God, save my daughter. And every day I would claim the Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God, Please cover her head with the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and give her, you know, cover her loins with a belt of truth and all those things. And seven months into this relationship, Judy said, David, it's over. They were talking about marriage, and I said, as long as there's a God in heaven, it's not over yet, Judy. It's not over yet. Well, at Thanksgiving time, she broke up with his character. <laughs> Hallelujah! And two months later, she met Benjamin Creer. And they've been married for seven years. December 16 will make seven years. What happens if God doesn't answer that prayer? You see, God will not force the heart. God has a plan B, and a plan C, and a plan D. (laughs) And the more it goes down to that next plan, the more we need to pray. Amen? You never stop praying. And then on July 6th of 2013, my brother was in a head-on collision on Taswell Pike in Knoxville. He crossed over a double yellow 
and plowed into another pickup. They had to cut him out with the jaws of life. And his body was mangled. And he lay in a state of unconsciousness for two and a half weeks at UT Medical Center. And that next morning, I got word that late that night, and the next morning I was there at his bedside, and I, I saw these, you know, scores of tubes and wires coming out of him. I listened to him gurgle through that breathing tube, and I said, God, it's over. And my brother doesn't know you. And I began to despair, and God reminded me of Ezekiel chapter 37. You know about the valley of dry bones? And God said, David, if I am able to piece those bones together and make perfect whole bodies again, I can heal your brother's broken body. And if I can breathe new life into those corpses so that they become an exceedingly great army, I can heal your brother spiritually. And so I began to pray, God, heal him physically. God, heal him spiritually, please intervene. Two and a half weeks later, he opened his eyes. And seven weeks into this experience, they rolled him out in a wheelchair. He came home. And he will never work another day in his life. He's handicapped for life. But he's alive. And I have seen my brother begin to wake up spiritually too. He asked me, uh, he asked me several years ago, he said, hey David, what, what translation of the Bible would you recommend? I'd like to start reading my Bible again. I said, man, is that my brother? And then I was doing evangelistic meetings in Bowling Green, Kentucky at the time, and he said, hey, David, I, I understand you're making DVDs of your sermon series. Could I have a set of that? Is that my brother? I want to ask you a question. God asked you a question. Who do you know? who is in the spiritual ICU unit right now? Who do you know who's in the spiritual ICU unit right now? And what are you going to do about it? I'm thankful that God is patient. <laughs> and I'm thankful that standing head and shoulders over Moses and Abraham and Daniel and Ezekiel and Horatius, Jesus is the mightiest prayer warrior there's ever been. And he invites us to just partner with him. He's the prayer warrior. We just kind of add our little drop along with his mighty torrent of prayer. And when we forget to pray, he never ceases to pray because Hebrews 7.25 says, he ever lives to make intercession for us. Hallelujah for that. I want to go back to Ezekiel. And I'm going to have a little, take a little liberty to exercise a little tweak in Ezekiel 22.30. Are you ready? You ready for the little editorial tweak? <laughs> so I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. And I found one. I found one. I found Joy and Harold and Gary and John and Mark. I found one. And your prayers combined with his mighty prayers will make an eternal difference in those lives. What do you say we stand in the gap? I told you I was going to give you an appeal. No fanfare, no music. If you would like to recommit yourself this evening to being an intercessory prayer warrior, not because you're worthy, not because you're great, but because he's great and you want to partner with him tonight. Would you be willing to stand with me?
Lord, thank you for being the mightiest prayer warrior there's ever been. We thank you for not giving up on us. We thank you for sending people into our life who have stood in that gap in our behalf. And we are seated here tonight because of your grace and because of some mom, some dad, some uncle, some brother, sister who was praying for us. And Lord, help us to pass it forward. Help us to join you. Tonight we stand not because we're bold, but because we're confident in you. And we want you to use our feeble prayers, join with your mighty prayers, to make the difference in the lives of those people. So Lord, whether it's a 10 most wanted list written on college-ruled paper or a prayer journal or names written on a, a sticky note attached to our bathroom vanity, Lord, help us to begin praying. And we thank you and give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.